Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the panel discussion that follows our first uh, half uh, a pr a morning presentation uh, on hemophilia A and B. I'm really uh, pleased uh, to have Dr. Jill Johnson uh, join us to moderate and lead this panel discussion uh, where I think some very important topics will be discussed. Dr. Johnson, I'll let you take over. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Valentino. Uh, I, it's my pleasure to moderate, and I think we all want to get on with some very interesting panelist discussions uh, stimulated by the questions from you and our community and viewing audience. Um, so I have uh, already received a number of questions, and uh, the way we're going to do this is I will either direct a question to our invited speaker, Dr. Faust, or to uh, Dr. Von Truskowski, uh, who I, I apologize in advance um, is uh, uh, for mispronouncing her name, um, uh, who is uh, representing the chairs, the co-chairs of this uh, working group, who uh, we will um, then stimulate an interesting panel discussion, I hope, to answer your questions and some things that have no answer, discuss them. Um, so first, I'm going to start off um, with a couple of questions to the working group chairs. Um, which is uh, number one, uh, the research your working group proposed has all has the potential to be impactful. Um, to what extent was the scoring of the proposals influenced by feasibility? And what specific barriers downgraded the feasibility of otherwise high priority research questions? Okay, thank you, Dr. Johnson. Your name is definitely much easier to pronounce. No access, no practice needed there. <laughs> Um, yeah, so feasibility, I think, weighed in quite a bit um, in terms of downgrading certain questions, because for some things where you wished you would have, for instance, a large randomized trial or this is or that could only be answered conclusively that way, that obviously would drag down a really important question. But I would like to re-emphasize that all the questions that you see um, that have been discussed in the talk are important and so they are all listed it's just those who made it up into the red boxes who were somehow low risk easy feasible and super important to answer that does not disqualify all the others from needing attention and perhaps then a second look as to how they could be addressed in creating infrastructure what does That's that answer it hopefully I think that was a, a great answer that also gave some um, uh, illumination into how um, the how the prioritization process worked and that really there are so many important questions, um, as you said. Uh, this question is to Dr. Faust. Equity and access to care for inherited bleeding disorder individuals has been a priority focus for the NHF. How should NHF interpret your first shibboleth and your suggestion of a minimum standard of care as the goal for equitable access? And what would this look like? Um, so is that a question about what, what's in the decent minimum? That is what's the, the least medical care that everybody's entitled to. Right, um, in light, in light of, of the audience here, which is the NHF, Inherited Bleeding Disorder Community, um, what would that look like um, with regard to goals for equitable access? What's the minimum standard of care as the goal for equitable access? How does what? How do you approach that? Well, I mean, first you would you would start with hoping to have to live in a country in which there's agreement that everybody's entitled to a decent minimum of health care. That nobody should go with no health care, or more importantly, no insurance, no financial coverage for health care. And so that's problem number one is we start, are still the only country in the industrialized world that doesn't accept that principle in which we still have <clears throat> millions of people who are uninsured and uh, private or public. Um, so uh, that would be the first step. And uh, in 250 years, we still haven't been able to get agreement on that. We're, we're moving in that direction. The Affordable Care Act was a major advance in reducing dramatically reducing the number of people who had no health care. Um, once you have a country uh, where everybody, it's agreed that everybody's entitled to some health care, which is pretty much every country in the world, um, 
uh, it's not that hard to <laughs> figure out what's in the decent minimum. That is, if you look at countries similar to us, like Canada, UK, Western European countries, and so on, there's not a huge debate about um, what's, what's in the basic benefits package. That is, the debate occurs when you start getting to extraordinarily expensive interventions that um, will break the budget. And in, in other countries, they have ways of, of making those decisions. So in the UK, for example, the, the UK equivalent of the FDA, when they approve a drug, they, not, they don't just consider safety and efficacy as we do, but cost. And they have an actual formula. It's roughly based on cost per quality adjusted life years. So even if a drug will save lives, uh, if it's going to cost millions of dollars a year and there's a large number of people with that disorder and it's going to break the budget, um, it's not approved. Um, so um, extraordinarily expensive things that affect large numbers of people uh, don't get approved. And, and, and they do that because, um, and, and there's not much debate about it, because it, it's a country which accepts rationing. That is, it's another problem with the United States is that we've never been able to get support for the notion that rationing of healthcare and everything else is inevitable. So um, um, it's complicated, but I, let me, I, I think the, the short answer is number one, to first get agreement that everybody is entitled to a decent minimum. Second, to have a mechanism for bringing costs of drugs and other interventions down. And by the way, one of the problems with the United States, I mean, our, as everyone knows, our cost per, our, our healthcare costs per person are off the charts, literally off the charts. If you look at, if you line up every country in the world and look at how much money they spend per person, the United States doesn't appear in that graph. It's just way off the graph. And that's because we have extraordinary waste, administrative waste, um, paying for useless therapies and so on. So it all gets back to the kind of uh, political system you have and whether you have a, a political system in which there's agreement that everyone's entitled to a decent minimum, you have agreement on how to keep costs down, you have a, a way of negotiating drug costs with pharmaceutical companies which the United, State, the United States doesn't. So it, other countries have figured this out and it's not that controversial. It's not that difficult. It's not that there aren't tough cases, but it's hard in the United States because we have no organized system for doing it. So it, I guess the short answer will be, look at Canada, look at UK, look what's in the, in the basic benefit. By the way, all, all these countries have better outcomes than we do, that is, Health, health outcomes by almost any measure is better in almost, the United States is very low on the list of measurable health. Um, despite spending two to three times more per person for healthcare, we don't have anything to show for it. So if we could have a system that was more like Canada, more like UK, more like Germany, France, et cetera, we would have lots more people covered and we'd have lots more and we'd have, we'd have everything that pretty much people want in the basic benefits package. I have a very, I hope, um, simple follow-on, but probably isn't simple at all, um, is that um, in our, in the NHF bleeding disorder community, one of the real challenges is that they are rare disorders and the treatments are very expensive. Um, and so um, in generalized health uh, approaches, you know, looking at the most number of people with benefit or what is a QOL outcome with regards to the how much it costs to get there in this community, that's a big sensitivity because of how rare, how they don't have a big cohort and the treatments, especially new treatments, but even older treatments are quite expensive. Um, and so it, I don't know if uh, there's a brief comment on, on you know, just to acknowledge that, or if there's a specific thought um, with um, when looking to another industrialized country, they're also struggling with that is my understanding. And then I'd like to, yes, I'll let you yeah, answer so that. Maybe, maybe I can, I can weigh in a little bit. I think coming from, from a part of the world, I've been raised, born and raised in, in Germany and came perhaps in my early thirties to the United States. And Ulrike can probably talk to that as well. And coming back to what's the affordable minimum for everyone to access is very simple. It's prevention, it's vaccination, hot topic these days. It's a maternal health. We have through here in the United States, horrible outcomes like 
equaling the Republic of Congo. And I think this is sad. And this is just very simple. And I give you an anecdote. When I first came to New York, I was in, in New York in my early 30s. And I needed my, as a fellow, I needed my, my annual wellness exam, let's say. I made an appointment down the street I was a gynecologist and then came there and I wanted to check in and she said, well, how are you planning to pay for this credit card, check or cash? And I said, oh, neither. I was, I was flabbergasted. I was so naive. I had no idea that you asked for a regular wellness exam to, uh, to, to pay. And that was clearly beyond my means as a fellow, what was then $300 or some such thing. So I turned it down. I, I went back at those times. There were no emails yet. I wrote a letter home to my parents telling how, how astounded I was about that. And everything flows from there. So I think that just gives you a, per, a perspective. Um, sad. So I think that's where we have to do put, put, put some work in and then higher cost drugs, for instance, the bleeding disorder community, will become affordable because people are generally healthy. There is more budget for, um, for, for, for drugs like that because people are in general more healthy. We don't have to spend hundreds of thousand dollars on, on end of life because people don't get that stroke because they get their high blood pressure medicines in time. Uh, just a yeah, bit of I, I, yeah, I think that's correct for many, if not most diseases, but not for most bleeding disorders. That is, there's nothing anybody preventive Healthcare is not going to prevent hemophilia or prevent a person with hemophilia from having. I mean, there are certain things uh, persons, patients can do, but uh, genetic disorders like that are obviously very. Uh, personal behavior is is going to be a very limited benefit. Let me just say something about um, the, the extraordinary cost of treatment for rare disorders um, like hemophilia. So. It, it, Healthcare is the most common cause of bankruptcy in America. It's the most common cause of personal bankruptcy, of, of, of small, the reason small businesses go out of business is because they can't afford to pay health insurance for their employees. And it's, it's the most, um, it's the major cause of bankruptcy of state and federal governments. The, the reason we're running out of money, the single most common reason for that is healthcare. But the reason the United States is so far ahead of every other country in cost per per person is is it, it are things that are solvable and that is it doesn't need to be that way um, and and this is a long-winded way of saying dis disorders like hemophilia are not the reasons for those runaway health care costs the reasons for for example the, the largest reason is administrative costs just be, because we don't have a single payer system because we have literally 1500 payers in private insurance companies, state and federal government, the overhead, the number of people who work at clerical jobs to administer those payments is in the hundreds of billions with a B dollars per year. That is, if we continue to provide all the health care we now do, all of it, but had one insurance company instead of 1,500 insurance companies, we would save somewhere between 300 and 500 billion dollars a year. Well, that dwarfs the amount of money that's spent on rare disorders like hemophilia or even intensive care or neonatal intensive care. That is the, the, the place where the money is going down the sewer. That is where we're spending money and it's not helping anybody. A big part of that is our administrative overhead. That's why the, the Clinton Healthcare Task Force, which I had the privilege of serving on, the main point of the Clinton proposal was to have, instead of 1,500 insurance companies, to have five or 10. That was all. It had no intention of taking away anybody's health care or requiring the doctor to, the government to pick your doctor or anything else. It was a change in the insurance payment system. And of course, it got defeated because the insurance companies and lots of other people were terrified at the prospects of moving money. The, the second major cause of waste are things that we spend on healthcare that have no measurable effect on health. Um, I'll just mention one example because I've spent a lot of years studying it and it's growth hormone for children with short stature. We spend billions of dollars <laughs> on children with short stature um, raising their height by three, four or five inches, which has no effect on their health and no measurable effect on their quality of life. 
they may feel a little better about themselves or their parents may feel a little better, but it doesn't save any lives. It doesn't prolong lives and it doesn't improve their quality of life in any way that anyone's been able to measure. We are constantly approving drugs like that, um, recombinant growth hormone, that have some measurable biologic effect like improving height, but don't really have any effect in improving health in any sense of the word of, or even quality of life. So we spend just lots of money on things that have no measurable health outcomes um, in contrast with other companies. So hemoph hemophilia is, and rare other rare disorders, even when there are drugs that cost a million dollars a year, which sounds um, very dramatic, that's not where the, the hundreds of billions of dollars are, are going. It's going to things like administrative costs and things that don't improve health in any measurable sense. So I, I don't think it's, 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 un, it's not reasonable to have a fight over whether we should provide a million dollar drug to patients with hemophilia. That's not where the problem is. Let, let me say that, by the way, we, we should have a discussion about why it costs a million dollars. That is how much profit is being made off of that and is that an unreasonable amount of profit? And could is it the case that pharmaceutical companies would not have an incentive to produce these drugs if their profits were reined in somewhat. And, and the evidence for that is, as you all know, many of the drugs that we charge a million dollars for, the same company charges less for in other countries with single payer systems. Um, I'm more familiar with vaccines in which a vaccine, a single vaccine that costs two or $300 in the United States can cost 10 or $20 in Canada or other places. But the company still finds it in its interest to sell that vaccine at a cost that's one tenth or less of what the U.S. So it, the the cost, uh, the, the the prices that pharmaceutical companies charge to Americans is also so. These are all political problems, and that all gets to our uh, political system, our campaign financing system, why legislatures are not responsive to these problems. Uh, that's where the basic problem is. Wow, thank you. That was an amazing and comprehensive answer. And I think for NHF and uh, in our whole community, it's helpful to be able to frame thoughts like this to where where do the where do the problems of this community and research fall relative to these bigger problems? I'm sure NHF isn't going to be able to solve how American healthcare. Um, but it also speaks to us as researchers and engaged providers to make sure that we provide those data that what we do helps people too. Um, as, as a general as a general point, and to frame identify important priorities, and to and to have systematic ways to address them, so that we provide the data that something works or something doesn't. Simplistically, but with that thought, I'm going to switch uh, switch to some questions for our scientific panelists. And Dr. Foss, there are more questions coming, but I kind of want to make sure that we kind of um, maybe have some of the discussions on the priorities, and then with that light, we can come back to you um, for more for more questions. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, uh, one question at a high level, we'll try and get some global questions out of the way, is to Mr. Skinner, uh, what would you consider, and they put the single greatest barrier to people with hemophilia to achieving health equity first in the U.S. and globally, um, but I I'm sure there's not a single one, but that intention was to, to talk about what you think is important as barriers to people with hemophilia and achieving equity. Uh, wow, that, I mean, that's a, that's a great question and a, and a big question. And so first, I want to congratulate the panel. I wasn't a part of this working group. I participated in others. But so I just having seen the recommendations for the first time uh, uh, a day or so ago, I, I want to congratulate the panel for a really comprehensive list. And if I was to try to pick one out of this list, I think it would be virtually impossible. But the concept of health equity is one that, that I'm passionate about, I think, uh, as is NHF and most in the community. And what that really means to me is that we, we need to look beyond where we've been with hemophilia, treating to a, a minimum standard where we've typically treated to low factor levels and enough to sort of attain survivability. And now we're really thinking about something normal. So I guess the, the most important thing to me is to make sure that the outcomes that we're thinking about really reflect those outcomes that are important to living uh, a life sort of free of pain, um, with spontaneity, without fear, really without limitations. 
Uh, and the typical metrics that are used to bring you know, new drugs and therapies to market often are designed to achieve FDA approval uh, and regulatory authorization. And they really don't have the opportunity to reflect the whole of life experience in terms of outcomes. So I'm, I'm a proponent of value-based care. Now, I'm not looking at just the cost, but looking at the value it delivers for patients. And I think we're moving into that era. I think it was nicely reflected in the descriptions that were provided of uh, the patient centricity, that the goals really are built around items that uh, patients have identified with, whether it's the joint health and the resulting pain, whether it was the transition issues, whether it was the underserved population. So uh, I come back to value, health equity, and focused on outcomes of importance to patients. And I think that will help us solve many of the problems of, is the investment worth it? Um, uh, and we won't just be thinking of what's the minimum um, for me to be able to survive. Thank you. The, the ideas are sometimes so big, I don't have much to say other than we just kind of moder keep moderating our discussion. Um, and I think that that was the intention, I think, of, of all of the, all this entire activity. Um, to Dr. Von Truskowski, um, uh, how much influence did patient SMEs have in the prioritization process? A lot, because that was the beauty of the whole exercise. Um, for all the working groups, um, I, I should say, because patients were involved, patient advocates were involved. So these panels were truly multidisciplinary. And I think um, all of my panel, panel members can confirm that we had them really involved, looking at things from multiple different angles. And I have to say that was the pleasure. And I hope my panelists or my all, all, all the folks who contributed to this would think the same. It was a pleasure to hear all the different views because usually we live in these boxes where we just talk to ourselves, physicians to physicians, patient advocates to patient advocates, pharmaceutical, talks to ph pharmaceutical, perhaps on some advisory board, they get some insight. But really this was, um, heated would be the wrong word, but quite inspired on occasions um, to, to sort of emulate all the different aspects um, and formulate a question. So yes, there was lots of input and that was very pleasurable. Opened my eyes, certainly. And I don't know, Doris, maybe I give pass that on to you, for instance. Um, what, 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 what were your thoughts regarding that process? Uh, no, I agree. Um, there was um, the that I served on three of our sub panels um, as part of our working group. And on each working group, there was input from um, somebody from the community. And in my case with gene therapy, uh, one of our uh, working group people was a mother with two children with hemophilia. So her input was quite enlightening, I think, in many respects, because we don't get in talking to patients, right? But we didn't get those inputs usually in panels and um, it was just good to get their perspective on it. So I agree with you. It was uh, great to be working with them. Maybe we go around the room. Amy, how, do, how did you feel about patient involvement and what was your perception? Yeah, I think it was great to have so many patients involved, of course. Um, what I teach all of my trainees is if you've met one person with hemophilia, you've met one person with hemophilia. So, of course, we couldn't get every voice represented, but I think these guidelines in my mind are not guidelines, but these proposals that, that the working groups have set forward should really be living documents, right? They should evolve um, over time and will continue to get input um, as we move forward with some of these priorities. So, I think it was great and um, maybe one of the best. Uh, things that came out of uh, the COVID era was was the ability to have meetings like this with people from around the world quite easily. So I think it was a really great process. Um, there's a related a related question. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna collapse two questions that we received that are related related to um, the model that that identified who participates. And part of that is related to the hemophilia treatment center, HTC model. Um, and so um, the, the initial question was how do HTCs incorporate research into their comprehensive care model? But I think relevant to this particular conversation is also how can patients outside the federally funded HTC systems be engaged in development of their research agenda? 
and participate in research and benefit from research, um, which I think is, um, is part of what we're saying. Not every voice is here, but that's a systematic point about the HTC structure. So uh, I'll, I'll toss it to our esteemed co-chair who, who knows who in our panel might best be able to address this. Well, I am not entirely sure. I think everyone might have an opinion. Why don't, if anyone wants to, oh, Mark, you, you wanna say something? Well, I'd, I'd be happy to, because I, I do think that there is a definitional issue here when we think of research. And I think often we think of research in a clinical setting, but there are a whole range of types of research. You know, and as an individual that lives with severe hemophilia, I think one of the greatest contributions that we can make is participating in the outcomes research initiatives, helping, helping to document and participate both in the registries, things like the CBR, other patient outcome studies, so that what matters to us is clearly recorded. And we can actually have, you know, a, we can quantify the qualitative experience of living with hemophilia. And that will really go to both the value proposition as well as making sure that health equity uh, is available. So even though an individual is not in a clinical study, they can be both in observational studies as well as participate, even if they're not seen in an HTC in the CVR, that, um, the Community Voices and Research that NHF is leading and other initiatives to make sure their voice is there. And that is research, although it's, you know, it may be a different um, type than what's traditionally thought of, whether it's bench or clinical, but that is an important part of research that's growing and that as patients, we really do need to step up as, uh, as the consumers, the family members, um, but Mark, would you agree that those patients, unless, so who are not part of HTTCs, unless they are really linked in with the local chapters, NHF or other like WHF, et cetera, uh, it will be really hard because imagine they go, some go to a hematology or primary care office um, without even knowing that these entities exist, because you do have, I think, to have a certain level of education or insight or um, aptitude to sort of link on the outside, not be part of an HTTC or HTC, not being motivated um, or um, informed what's out there in terms of patient organizations. How would how do you catch those people to participate and even recognize that this is all there for them? So, I mean, we, we do require, um, you know, community providers and others to refer to an HTC or to ref refer to the community-based groups or NHF, and if they don't find one on the internet generally. So, I was, in, this, in my previous answer, I was assuming that, you know, uh, an individual had made contact and was wanting to be involved, but they weren't seen in an HTC. And my point there was that should not limit their ability to, to participate in meaningful research, there is ways they can do it. In terms of the broader outreach, uh, you know, that is a perpetual challenge. And, and hopefully over time, either working um, you know, through the providers or even potentially working through uh, payers, which we're increasingly doing when payers start getting claims for hemophilia bills, that they make sure that uh, they're referring patients back to or reaching back out to make sure those patients get to the right specialized care. And I think we're seeing more of that as well. So it, it is going to take all of us to do our part to make sure we um, you know, continue our journey to try to get 100% coverage within the HTC network. Um, but it's uh, it, people have to be willing to be found. Uh, and then we probably need other structures because we can't go knock on every door. Mm -hmm. Um, some we have quite a few questions where there's like a specific topic in one of the priorities, but also have generalizable points. So I'm going to pick gene therapy from our question list to talk about, which is, um, I think, uh, and, and I'll and I'll Ellen, again rely on Anetta to say um, who uh, who in the panel will help, and please raise your hands as well. So first, I think we should tar talk about the where the priorities might intersect with gene therapy. And then there are a number of ethical related questions that I have in various forms, which are basically to Dr. Foss to talk about the, again, you know, which you addressed in your talk, but to expand more in the context of this discussion, um, you know, regarding access, but also the impact of doing something that alters a genome. So maybe first for the science to talk about gene therapy, which is a hot topic, which has many aspects and intersects with several priorities. Well, that's easy. I will pass that on to Dr. Rice, who was leading our gene therapy effort panel. 
and um, hope that she can answer and intersect with, um, with Dr. Faust to have a lively conversation. Um, thank you for the question. So regarding the science, I um, feel the, the field is, is still early, but a few phase three studies are running. None of the products is approved at this time because um, efficacy and safety is not um, evaluated to the end. So at that point in time, um, I, I feel there's a lot of work going on to clearly look into further um, about collection of data and, and of, of efficacy and safety to make it most um, effective for patients. Um, but uh, it's not at the, at the end at this point. And even if, if any product would be approved soon, that would not be the, the final stretch either, because it's very important to, um, to look at all the other, the various products which are um, being developed and have different efficacy and safety uh, results so far. Um, I feel there's, there's a lot of work going on in the science, but more of course needs to be uh, and is being done towards safety and efficacy, which some of it can only be found out over time. Um, regarding, um, so in, in our group, you know, as you've seen with, with our, our top results or research questions came out as, as the patient-centered questions, which, which is a reflection of the important input of, of the patients and, and the importance which is being seen that, that patients have a role in determining what we should be looking for, uh, but also came out of um, the thought that patients need to be well informed in order to be able to advocate for development and, and availability and affordability of safe and effective products. Um, so that all leads into what we have been discussing already. Um, at this point, uh, a broad availability to, to the large patient population is is somewhat limited because all the studies have been done with a very select group of patients and, and patients with like inhibitors or positive AV antibodies have, have um, been, been left out at this point. So um, it, it's not a catch thing for all. And then of course there are a, a lot of ethical questions. Um, you know, does it really change the genes at this point, there's no evidence that it would lead to any germline changes. Of course, lentiviral vector um, approach is a little bit different because it leads to integration or to more to 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 focused integration of the genes uh, into the chromosomes. And but these studies are really at the beginning with phase one studies. Um, these are just a few thoughts, and uh, I'll I'll give it over to to Dr fast to, to uh, add something from his perspective. So we still have you muted. All right, thank you. Um, so as I mentioned in the talk, uh, with regard to somatic gene therapy trials, I don't think there's any reason to think of these as being qualitatively different than any other kind of risky and innovative uh, experimental intervention. Uh, obviously one needs to study benefits, risks and so on. Um, but the fact that it's a gene, I don't think makes it different than a pharmaceutical or a biologic or, or other sorts of things that have unknown benefits and risks. Um, I think it's, um, uh, the, with regard to germ cell therapy, um, obviously that's at a much more primitive, as we know, much less. We're, we're nowhere near being able to change genes in embryos and be confident about uh, long-term risks, um, uh, unanticipated and undesirable genetic side effects. So lots more animal work is needed in that area. But I think the, the, the more... Um, the common objections to germline therapy, namely that it will affect future generations. I've never quite understood 
why that is a bad thing, why that's not a good thing and, and why it's a bad thing. That is, if it's safe and effective and if we can change the hemophilia gene and turn it into a normal clotting gene and that affects untold numbers of generations, well, why, what's wrong with that? Um, obviously, um, if it has adverse effects that affect future generations, that's a bad thing, but that's also true for the somatic therapy also. That is, we, we don't want bad things. So this effect, on this, this claim that germline therapy should be prohibited because it affects future generations, as I say, is not coherent to me. As I mentioned, we have many other genetic technologies that affect um, future generations, including just current standard treatments of hemophilia itself, which affects future generations. That is, prior to effective treatments for hemophilia, many such individuals died, obviously, before they could procreate. Um, and the ability to enable such individuals to, um, to procreate increases the frequency of the gene in the population, which affects future generations. That, that's never been thought to be a sufficient reason to prohibit uh, interventions just because future generations are affected. So um, those are just some uh, uh, a rejection of some of the common chivalrous and objections that are made to uh, somatic and uh, germline therapy. The, the costs again um, are, are the big issue. That is if and when effective gene therapy are discovered, the, the costs will certainly be very high. I think we need to be more critical about why that is and what a reasonable return on investment is for pharmaceutical companies. But even given that there may be unreasonable profiteering in areas like this, uh, that's, that's not a place to start our discussion about uh, healthcare costs and, and, and waste in healthcare costs. That is the amount of money that we spend on rare disorders, as I said, uh, a bit earlier. That's that's not where the where the where the money is where the big bucks are going. The big bucks are going for things that affect millions and hundreds of millions of people, not thousands or tens of thousands of people. So um, um, those are just my initial thoughts on that. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, we're gonna, um, I think these are recurring themes. Um, nearly every priority pulls out so much of the intersection of these sort of, of, of key themes. Um, and some of them are in access to care and access to research, which is what we've been talking about. We also have in our priorities, critical scientific advances um, that are basic and translational and techn technological development needs. Um, and then um, we also have education and information um, for, for everyone, community, providers, scientists, that it's a crosstalk. Um, and I, so I think that, that we have many overlapping themes. So what I thought I would continue to do is pull on a specific question that's coming from something that was highlighted in a priority to stimulate this larger discussion and hope, hopefully between many of the panelists with all their different perspectives. So one of them has, I've got a couple of questions on hypertension which is a very specific in the priority, but I think has bigger themes. So one of them was sort of is, you know, are, is, is there a difference in the blood pressure that you might be um, addressing in a, in a patient with a bleeding disorder, such as hemophilia versus, versus not specifically in hemophilia, since we're in the hemophilia working group. And then at, at, at a higher level, this also illustrates intersectionality, for example, race and ethnicity, the impacts of being hypertensive, the likelihood you're hypertensive and accessing care for hypertension is not equal in this country. Um, and so that brings into race and ethnicity or, or any other things that may introduce barriers to access to care. So I think the first question would be for the cardiovascular group um, to, to toss it back to our esteemed chair um, to, to do priorities. And then I hope a discussion on you know, um, race and ethnicity and, and having an inherited bleeding disorder and having other medical conditions. Yeah, exactly. The hypertension is a big issue because um, it is some for some reason increased in hemophilia and um, we don't know exactly why, but what it does in even non-hemophilia people, hypertension causes hemorrhagic strokes and turns out that pe people with hemophilia die a lot of hemorrhagic strokes. So this is where it comes back to the basics and how do we even get people to afford their blood pressure medications, which might be really critical. Um, let, let alone clotting factor. And so with that, 
I'll hand it over to Dr. Kwan. Thank you, Annetta. And um, I just want to echo what Dr. Van Dragowski said. Um, we actually collaborated together on a project, which again, as she mentioned, hypertension is more prevalent in the hemophilia community. And th that's also been verified uh, um, with other studies from other countries. So we, we know it's not just in the US. And as you mentioned that it goes just beyond hemophilia, but it also runs into other ethnicities. And some, some medications, for example, may work better in some groups uh, and historically perhaps African-Americans, there are specific medications that might be better for them that work better in those groups. And I'm not single, singling them out. It's just something that I recall from my training years ago. But again, access, so we know that hypertension um, is prevalent. We also know that with uncontrolled hypertension that could lead to CNS bleeding um, if they're also not taking their um, hemophilia medications and you have severe hemophilia. And I've had, and I'm sure others who've taken care of adults have the same problem that they have to dealt with um, bleeding. So it, it gets very complicated because we know hypertension is a problem we actually focus on it. And I think this is where then education becomes important, um, that everybody should be educated and in turn, the, I mean, the HTCs, and then the HTCs in turn have to turn and educate the, the uh, patients and make sure that their hypertension is taken care of. This is where we have to pull in primary care doctors too. And unfortunately, access of care is limited and we end up our HTC and others chime in please, because I know that every HTC is different in how they manage their patients, but we try to get our patients to go to their primary care doctors. They either have lack of access to primary care doctors or they, they don't like going. So we manage their hypertension. Um, and that, that can create problems. So uh, not a problem for us, for example, but uh, if we have to manage their hemophilia as well as their hypertension. Um, so that is, is another point of the HTC. So um, I want to interject a uh, question from Steven to, to add to this and then let the, let the conversation continue. Um, I was reminded that um, the inclusion of women um, in or people of a female sex um, in studies with hypertension, which is an issue in cardiovascular and hemophilia, to consider that also as part of this conversation. So it's a great point from someone from the audience. So I just wanted to pop that in yeah. while you can. No, this is a great point because in all the studies um, we have done so far, you know, we really focused on males. And just a little anecdote, this is how we all opened this field. It was when I took over, over a decade now, the current hemophilia treatment center, then from a fellow to faculty, and I was familiarizing myself with 120 charts of patients with hemophilia whom I had never seen before, and were all of a sudden under my care. And these were paper charts. This was an epic then, and I opened the chart, and then after number 10, everyone had a young, everyone had a high blood pressure, and no one was on blood pressure meds, and they were young. And I thought, well, how can that be? Maybe it's just serendipity, the next 10 charts. Now, at least eight of those had high blood pressure. And so then Doris and I began to talk and we initiated studies, et cetera. And then we found out that the same was observed in, in, in Europe. So this field isn't all too old, um, it's young. And again, we don't know exactly why and what's happening, but the largest hurdle in clinic, yeah, right, Doris? First of all, mm -hmm. not everyone has a primary care physician. So we have to um, put on our internal medicine hat, number one. Number two, getting the young guys to um, take blood pressure pills and to make them understand that they have high blood pressure maybe at the age of 25 and now they have to be on a pill um, is an, an, an amazing challenge. And I think it's just people are not attuned to it. They're not educated enough about cardiovascular disease. So yet it is so important. So I don't know what your experiences are or anyone else who uh, yeah. is in an adult setting. 
I, I think this is just a good example of how hypertension, which is so simple, can encompass so many things where we're talking about education, we're talking about access to care, and we're talking about access to their medications. Um, it, it, even though it's such a simple problem, right? I yeah, and I don't know, really Courtney, yeah. um, from a pediatric perspective, I think you have also published in the area. Um, what's your experience in the, in the children? Sure, yes, thank, thank you for the, the question. And um, uh, we did take a look um, at our, our male hemophilia um, population, um, pediatric population, and did see some at least prehypertension, and then some of the, the risk factors that, you know, um, I guess outside of hemophilia can exacerbate this, particularly related to obesity and um, um, diet choices, exercise choices. And you know, one of our uh, conclusions was that actually in sort of the HTC model where we have, you know, of course the hematologists, but genetic counselors, physical therapists, dietitians, um, and um, in pediatrics, we have a child life specialists who are involved in the education. We really have a great model to try to address um, some of these risk factors for hypertension and hopefully mitigate them. Um, but then, you know, um, Doris brings up excellent point in terms of then collaborating with primary care uh, physicians um, um, who can help um, with some of the health so health maintenance and avoidance of some of the, the chronic or adult onset uh, conditions. Um, and, uh, but I, I, you know, going back to the question that, that Joe had brought in that I don't think we have data on, on the women with, with hemophilia or other bleeding disorders. So um, that's a great point. So I was just going to weigh in for a minute because listening to this and listening to some of the gene therapy as well as our um, inhibitor subgroup, I think one of the things that you see and hear over and over again is sort of the interconnection of the need for education, the need for access. And then that really, I think, is what gets people engaged and wanting to know the research. Um, and our interactions in our working group with our patients um, and patient advocates, as well as uh, my many years of working um, through the NHF inhibitor summits, it's always been amazing for me to see how that education piece and the access piece leads to parents and families and patients wanting to be involved in answering some of those other questions and interested in you know, in the cardiovascular list, one of the things that was just outside the sort of high priority was some of the basic understanding of why. And I think, you know, as we get the community to understand that high blood pressure is a problem and we don't understand why, it really does circle back to get people to want to be a part of those biomarker studies, to want to be a part of perspective studies of interventions and outcomes and what it does for both their uh, life with hemophilia, but otherwise just their life of healthy living. And I think finding ways to keep those cycles of communications going both through the HTCs, but also through the chapters, you know, to have people who can come in and do the education, but also pique the interest of the research questions and, and have the ability to say, here's how you participate. Here's how you can be a part of this prospective study looking at biomarkers. Here's how you can get your kids and grandkids and nieces and nephews involved in the early studies of inhibitor development. So you know, I think from a patient um, and community perspective, those ongoing conversations so that we can continue to address all of the aspects um, that we need to address to make a difference and move forward. Well spoken, Shannon. Amy, you have your hand raised. Now, I just wanted to say that I think one of the, the biggest values that's gonna come out of this whole process is that we have engaged so many people from different walks of life, from all around the country, we've engaged pharma and consumers and providers and 
um, I think with the, particularly with the collaboration of NHF and HTRS and Athen, what I'm hoping is that as we look at all of these different whys that we still need to answer, we will have large groups of people working together using the same definitions, using the same data bases so that we can answer these questions sooner and that we can um, eliminate some of the duplication of efforts that's happening around the country and around the world. It doesn't make sense for Shannon to create an educational tool about hypertension and for Doris to create an educational tool about hypertension. Let's do this together. And I think we will all benefit from that. So I'm really hoping that this process is going to lead to additional collaboration, larger numbers of patients and, and families available for research, but you know, less duplication of effort. And that will just, will make so much more progress that way. Agreed, totally agreed. Ulrike, you were raising a hand. Yes, I would like to add to what Shannon Meek said about finding ways of educating, involving patients, involving just more people of the whole patient community, as well as providers, but let me focus on patients. I, I feel one chance for the NHF is to really look at health literacy, at how do we uh, transmit knowledge to our patients. There are always a few who are very good in picking up what we're saying, but I feel that almost none of us had, has an educational degree. We all kind of learn and do while we're working how on, and, and we teach patients, but it's very short. It's like two or three minutes during a clinic, clinic visit. It's, it's very rarely that we, we have more time and there's, but I observe there's no great method to it. <laughs> and I know there are a lot of educational methods. And I feel if we can increase the health literacy of patients and their understanding of what we know as providers of new drugs, new research findings of, of basic things, um, the patients will be able to more independently involve themselves into our discussions, but we need to, we, we could be, and NHF could support that in, in some research projects towards that. Uh, we could facilitate that, that patients really get taught appropriately with methods which are, you know, effect, effective and efficient and, and providers can learn how to talk better or how to submit information uh, better or in, in, a, in a more validated way, potentially. Just a few thoughts. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mike, Dr. Matthew, did you have your hand raised? Yeah, thanks. So I just wanted to reflect a little bit on what Amy was talking about in uh, harmonization of data collection and not repeating effort. Uh, so for those of you who are listening in who don't know about uh, my employer, the American Thrombosis and Hemostasis Network, or Athen. We are the organization that creates the data tools uh, that are used by the individual hemophilia treatment center network throughout the United States to collect data, both through very both for various federal projects as well as uh, research efforts. And uh, you know, in terms of what Amy was talking about of creating a harmonized approach to address these various comorbidities within the inherited bleeding disorders population. That would be a really great uh, role for Athen. I know we will be talking about this when working group six, I think the infrastructure working group um, gives their presentation. Um, but uh, be that as it may, really, I think we've got the system in place. We have the tools. We just have to create the, the, the forms, the tools, whatever we want to create in order to collect the data we want to collect nationally all in the same way. Uh, so uh, I'm looking at the time and I, there's it's impossible absolutely to cover everything, but I think one sort of larger topic 
um, that this working group and probably all of them uh, run into is that we set up sort of this traditional view of research, which I don't think researchers necessarily ascribe to. And then we have like what's new that's coming out of an approach like this kind of summit. Um, but I think that what's important is to say we did actually have quite a bit of basic translational, technical, laboratory diagnostic uh, conversations uh, within a number of the working groups. And um, there's a number of small questions that are related to very specific things um, under that group. So I think I'll just I'll pick on inhibitors as the thing to, to talk about, which is the basic science of inhibitors. And then is there a new way to, um, to can this bring a new way to think about linking um, that kind of science and basic science research to things that matter to patients in the community? So I'll, I'll take that one a little bit um, to start with. And I think one of the things that I would say, you know, in the sort of big scheme of things, and this um, uh, came out of the NHLBI State of the Science Summit that we had a few years ago on inhibitors particularly, but I think it really goes across the board here. And this is how can we as uh, community members and physicians, and especially those of us on the translational and basic research, how can we reach out to our colleagues across fields, across medicine, and get them interested in partnering with us to answer some of the major questions? It's unlikely that a vascular biologist who knows very little about hemophilia is going to get interested in um, really digging into why people with hemophilia have hypertension out of proportion to what they should for all of the rest of their uh, traits. But finding folks who can cross that bounds between hemophilia and partnering with team science, I think is gonna be key as we try to move a lot of this forward. One of the other things that I think came out of the inhibitor um, uh, group was, just how important and how critical it was to have validated assays where we have very good standard operating procedures and protocols so that we really can collect samples from patients during their initial exposure days when they're at highest risk for an inhibitor and really have a way to look at those assays, rank those assays, see what we can do to you know, get as much data as we can from our smallest of patients who um, obviously have very limited blood supply uh, and blood volumes that they can give us. Even if they want to participate, they can't give us the blood volume that lets us ask everything at once. And I think, you know, the gene therapy discussion here today is another one where I think the community really is starting to understand as we see things in the phase three trials and ask questions to reflect back to the science and really sort of support again, going forward, looking to answer some of those questions um, in the basic lab side of things to move forward. So I think, you know, when you looked at the rankings overall, oftentimes some of the basic science um, were not as low hanging fruit, were not as easy to think we are going to, um, accomplished, but I think it really does speak to the combinations of this working group and the infrastructure working group and others to really um, put the pieces in place that some of these important questions can get answered. And just to briefly chime in, I think Shannon, your effort with NHF is sort of intersects or is paralleled or can intersect with what you have done for NHLBI, but perhaps more the um, the more basic questions and translational questions are posed. And so in that sense, there should be a really um, rather comprehensive way forward in the inhibitor world. Attach, um, attaching, well, let's say answering or wanting to answer all those questions, basic translational and um, clinic, clinical for a roadmap. As part of that, there's a couple of questions on biomarkers, and I can see that we have a diverse interests in the audience. Um, so I don't really know how to pick on a single biomarker other than to say um, there's also multiple definitions of what a biomarker even means. But I think what will mean for this purpose is that a biomarker is something you measure um, biologically um, that is associated with um, an efficacy or outcome or some other thing. 
Um, and um, and that I think to me biomarkers sit right in the middle, but uh, they're the crux of translational research where you've discovered a mechanism or some other thing that's associated with something that hopefully this community has said is important. And how do you develop biomarkers and how do you use them? So I'll toss it to Dr. Grzelski to uh, to go ahead and um, stimulate the panel to discuss biomarkers which have come up in multiple questions. Well, I will, I think, draw in Dr. Steiner here and come a bit to speak about the physical aspects. Traditionally, biomarkers in the osteoarthritis world have been tried quite heavily in terms of prediction of joint disease or in the hemophilia world, perhaps a blood tests could be developed to detect bleeding or, um, again, progression of arthropathy. And so I'll, I'll give the thought to, to Dr. Steiner. Bruno, you wanna, want perhaps to chime in a little bit what that could mean for physical therapy for outcomes, joint disease, how could we use biomarkers? Oh my goodness. Um, thanks for lobbing that at me. Um, so good morning, everybody. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, we, we had quite the vigorous discussion as well within our, our group one sub um, subcommittee. Uh, and this was, this was raised, it was a hot topic. Uh, biomarkers. Uh, and I invite Amy Dunn to chime in as well. <laughs> so um, our cues as physical therapists are basically uh, navigating the, the exotic hemarthropathic landscape uh, of a deteriorating joint. And uh, our, uh, crucial to us is navigating a patient and managing them uh, beyond a bleed. And we need all the help we can get. We're getting a lot of help from muscus. Uh, in terms of determining whether there is an ongoing bleed uh, with uh, more of the, the, the gross signs of, of, uh, of the images, but in uh, perhaps in these smaller, smaller events that maybe the bleed that occurs is just a film of blood that we might not be able to detect with greater specificity. I feel uh, it, it, you know, it would be a great advantage to us in terms of um, the real-time management of a patient uh, when to make sure they're not loading their joints uh, in case there is an event. Uh, because as we know, uh, load bearing plus uh, presence of uh, blood in the joint, however small, is a, is a really deleterious thing to the maintaining chondrocytes. Uh, so to avoid any sort of apoptosis um, and cell harm, uh, we, really, <laughs> we really need all the help we can get. So this, these are uh, the great basic sciences question that we, we need to answer that would optimize our care and actually translate to something meaningful for us in management. What do you think, Amy? I, I totally agree. And this is where we need, you know, as many patients and as many biologic specimens as possible um, so that we can bring in scientists that are in different fields, like, like Shannon mentioned, get them interested in hemophilia. There might be an aha moment eventually in some of these areas, whether it's a biomarker for hypertension or for renal disease or for, you know, those folks who are at higher risk for intracranial hemorrhage or joint disease, you know, you know, you name it, we need a biomarker for it um, in all of medicine, but in particular with, with hemophilia, because we have such a small patient population, we really need to all work together in um, collaborative and team science. Um, but I, you know, I think that there's a lot of will um, within this, this, um, within this group of people that are involved in, in inherited bleeding disorders. And I think with additional organization and some additional resources, we can, you know, we can pick these topics off one by one and, you know, we'll get there. We've made more progress than almost any other rare disease in history in such a short period of time, because we have such passionate, um, people working in the field. So, we can get there, but there's still a lot of work to be done. But I think this, you know, this whole process is really setting us up for success in some of these areas. And the these definition are, of what great. biomarkers are will be crucial. And often we just think about it, what's in our blood or serum or plasma, but that's not the whole story. Just think, for instance, in the field of rheumatology, a positive bring it back to musculoskeletal ultrasound, a positive power Doppler signal, which would be considered an, a marker or a biomarker of inflammation. They even use that word, it's a biomarker of inflammation. Um, so it's not just blood tests. It's, for instance, a power Doppler signal on an ultrasound. It could be a finding on a physical exam, for instance, in 
in uh, in, P in, as a, in in physical therapy, just it's a biomarker of something or other that predicts or diagnoses um, and helps us manage things. And yeah, hopefully, we will progress there. So what a great discussion using a really specific example that I think a lot of the community can relate to um, and the importance of defining and bringing in interdisciplinary expertise. Um, I wanted to mention that um, NHF will be um, collecting the questions that have been asked and discussed, including ones that we unfortunately are not going to have time to get to um, and, and deliver that back um, uh, to, uh, uh, after the state of the science on the NHF website. Um, and so with that, I thought uh, with the little time we have left, there are sort of two big looming questions that are, are sort of themes in, in some of these questions. And one is the role of the HTC in this kind of research um, and the nature of that. And then I would really love to toss back at the end to Dr. Faust. Um, there's a number of questions on, and I know it's a charged word to talk about rationing, but to say, Aren't we already rationing by virtue of 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 the of the, the status of the healthcare system we have now, um, and to discuss sort of access to care in light of, of uh, and 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 the importance of research and the clinical research um, approaches um, uh, in light of the panel discussion. So first, um, for HTCs, for just a couple of minutes, if someone would like to talk about the HTC as a as a benefit, but also an interesting structural problem in access to research and then wrap up with our ethical conversation. Any takers? I may pick on Dr. Thornburg. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine, um, Joe. You know, I think with the you know the HTC model of care, we see that actually a lot of the different um, healthcare professionals on the team, um, you know, including physical therapists and uh, genetic counselors and uh, social workers and psychologists, can really all be engaged in um, in even leading um, research and then engaging. Uh, the patient. So I think, you know, over you know, the, the decades of, of HTC care, um, you know, research has been engaged and, and it really comes to both the engagement of um, the care team, but most importantly, um, you know, the patient com uh, community and um, willingness to um, share you know them, themselves and, and engage and you know want to give back to the community as a whole so um i, I think hdc model can really support this at the same time we do need to partner um you know with other community-based organizations so we can include um, individuals who don't receive care in sort of the federally funded HTC community. And you know, that can be done through NHF, I think. It, this is a start with the community voices in research, but you may have to think of other ways um, to, to move forward. Thanks. And Dr. Foss, you know, this is a, a sort of unique, not, I don't know how unique, but it's an unusual healthcare setting that our patients, many of our patients are in when they're in the HTC where it's funded through other mechanisms, including 340B, um, to provide comprehensive care, which is a little bit different than a lot of other American care. So um, I wanted to ask, you know, in this concept of uh, many questions have asked, what are your opinions on rationing? Um, but also, um, I think any any comment, this is, the stage is yours to, to close us out. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, rationing is unavoidable. All countries ration not just healthcare, but everything, food, shelter, clothing, education, transportation. No country can afford to give everybody everything that they want or need. <clears throat> and that includes healthcare. Um, you know, if everybody who died of heart failure got an artificial heart, uh, instead of spending <clears throat> 16 or 18 percent of our total American economy on healthcare, it would be 50 percent. So, um, Rationing is unavoidable, and and th that's the starting point. For somebody to say it's wrong to ration um, is an incoherent concept. So the issue is not whether we should ration healthcare, but how. Some countries do it by age. In the UK, you, you don't get transplants over a certain age. Some do it by waiting time. In Canada, you have to wait longer than in the US to get your hip replaced or <clears throat> other 
elective procedures. Some do it by cost. As I mentioned, the UK <clears throat> approves, when they approve drugs, they take cost into consideration on whether they approve it. So there are many different ways of rationing. In the two minutes remaining, I don't think we can have a, a robust discussion of what's the best way or how to do it. But I think the starting point is to resist the notion that we should not ration healthcare or to object to, to some decision because it involves rationing. Of course, we ration healthcare for patients with hemophilia and everybody else. So we, we have to start with that point. Thank you so much. And um, thank you so much for attending um, this panel discussion on hemophilia, um, which really kicks off the NHF state of the science. As we said, uh, there will be more on the kinds of really insightful and interesting questions this audience has asked uh, that will be on the web NHF website afterwards. Um, and this is a similar structure to many of the other working groups. So hopefully we've set a tone uh, and hopefully everyone can join us for the next sessions in the rare bleeding disorder working group. Thank you, everyone. Truly thank you. On behalf of my co-chair, Bobby Tran, who couldn't participate today, and all the, not only the panelists, obviously, who made this possible this Sunday morning, but also everyone who contributed to working group one. It was a huge effort, and I can only thank everyone for their thoughts and energy and willingness to meet almost on a weekly basis. So thank you all. <laughs>